What you're about to watch is the oldest son of the founder of Hamas tell you the truth about what's really going on in the current situation. Folks, the devil is the father of lies. He has come to steal, kill, and destroy, and it's time for us to open our eyes. And our only hope and solution to all of the things that we're discussing is found in the Word of God. Because God is a source of our peace and our hope. He's our foundation. And through Him, we find our source of life. All right, folks, let's get into it. And uh, look, I got to tell you, today is going to be a pretty eye-opening and incredible video because I'm going to be playing for you an interview that was recently done with the oldest son of one of the founders of Hamas. And it's very, very important that you listen to what he says from beginning to end. But before we go there, we got a lot to talk about today. And um, I, I'm doing as much as I can to not only bring you the facts related to the things that we're seeing in the Middle East and around the world, uh, because obviously I talk a lot about Bible prophecy. I talk about the biblical perspective on a lot of the things that are happening, not just in pop culture, but in politics and all the things around us. But I think that as we go over this stuff, we also have to talk about what the Bible says concerning how a lot of this stuff is being done and why it's being done. And I think when we start looking at the issue between Israel and uh, what everybody is calling Palestine and all the different factions going back and forth, Hamas and all of the things, you know, we're trying to surgically go through all of this and give you guys the best information that you can possibly get. But there are certain things that I think we have to stop for one moment and reflect upon and understand because if we're void of understanding in these matters, we're not going to have an easy time understanding what's really going on. Now, I want to make myself very, uh, very clear here. When we talk about anti-Semitism, anti-Semitism is a very real thing. It's happening and it's inspired by Satan. And the reason why it's inspired by Satan is if you don't have Israel, you don't have Christ returning. You don't have the end time scenario. You don't have all of the things that the Bible says are going to happen in the last days. You don't have a temple being uh, built. You don't have a final antichrist. You don't have, you know, all the things that Daniel talks about in Daniel chapter nine. You don't have any of the things that Jesus talks about in Matthew chapter 24. All of that stuff goes away. And so the devil has been very good at trying to remove Israel from the picture on a couple of different levels. Of course, the most obvious level is murder Jews. And if you can do that, then you can get rid of the end time scenario. And perhaps you might be able to stop Jesus from coming back. And now the devil knows better, but he's trying to make it as difficult as he possibly can because he is who he is. And so he is going to try to execute those things. And of course, the other way that he's going to do it is he's going to be an absolute deceiver. He's going to lie. That's going to be one of the ways that the devil is going to work, right? He's going to use any tool that's in his, um, in his bag, right? Any trick, any tool, any weapon, uh, he is going to try to form against God's purposes and plans. And part of that is going to be the culture of death. Part of that's going to be the murder, the killing, the hatred, all of those things. He brings all of that into play, right? And I think that it's very important. And of course, perhaps one of the most significant variables that end up coming into this is, yes, he's going to try to bring uh, death to the Jews. And if he can accomplish that, he will absolutely accomplish it. He's tried to do it throughout the years, throughout the tenure of human history, as long as the Jews have been around. Um, he tried to do it early on, even in the book of Genesis. We saw attempts to eliminate the Jewish people during the post-exilic period, the pre-exilic period, uh, the story of Esther. Uh, we you know, talk about this oftentimes. Uh, God uh, constantly has protected his people, but terrible, terrible attempts have been made to kill God's ancestrally chosen people. And I think that this is something that is so significant and so powerful that we have to stop and reflect upon for just a moment. Now, understanding that, the other thing that he's going to do is after he executes such a terrible and horrific attempt to take the lives of God's ancestrally chosen people, what he's then going to do is he's going to make up a whole bunch of lies to get people to think it never happened. Uh, he does this with Christians all the time because he doesn't want Christians to be around because if Christians are not around, then you don't have the gospel being propagated. And he forgets the basics, and that is the fact that God is going to do what God is going to do no matter what. 
but he does this and he's very good at it. And so I think we should talk about what Jesus uh, said concerning the devil. He's talking to the Pharisees here. This is uh, the gospel of John. This is chapter eight, verse 44. And look what he says. He says, you are of your father, the devil, and the lusts of your father, you will do. He was a murderer from the beginning right? We just talked about this, and abode not in the truth, because there is no truth in him. When he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own, for he is a liar and the father of it. Uh, oftentimes translated the father of lies. And I think it's really interesting because the Bible is true. It's God's uh, inspired word. We know what the Bible says, and we know that everything that the Bible says is real and it is consistent. This is not something that we are, uh, that we should be taken by surprise concerning, you know, regarding the devil. The Bible makes that very clear. And it's interesting because when the devil begins to deploy his agents, he continues to propagate lies. We talk about this oftentimes in uh, in Islam. Let me read something to you from the surah. It says this, and by the way, it's very eye-opening, right? And I'll read it in Arabic because I want you guys to understand what's being said and I'll translate it. And I've, I've read it many, many times, right? But it's interesting, right? It says, The way it's translated is, they were deceptive, referring to the Jews, right? And Allah was deceptive for Allah is the chief or the best of deceivers. Ah, uh, wow. Even the Quran or the Surah is actually saying that Allah is the chief of deceivers. I mean, this is the holiest writings in Islam, but you have to understand this is the very thing that we continue to talk about. The devil is good at communicating lies and the way that we reveal uh, the, the way that we deal with the lies is that we reveal the truth. And we're going to talk about this. Uh, I think one of the best ways to start is to hear from the perspective of a man who is beginning to see the truth on a whole bunch of levels. He is the eldest son of one of the co-founders of Hamas. And by the way, what he has to say here is absolutely astounding. Now, this is Pierce Morgan that's interviewing him. Uh, for those of you who don't know who Musab uh, Hassan Yusuf is, he's a very interesting guy. He's very truthful. We're going to air some of this interview for you, and I think you're going to be uh, mind boggled by what he has to say, and it's insightful. Now, mind you, you're going to hear some anger in his voice because he is angry, and he is admittedly not a believer. Um, he's searching for the gospel. He's searching for the truth, but he finds uh, Christ to be admirable. And so it's interesting what he says, not even being born again, but the type of things he brings to the table. So let's listen to what he has to say. It's pretty powerful stuff. And I'm joined now by Mossab uh, Hassan Youssef. Uh, Mossab, great to see you. Um, it's an extraordinary story, yours. Uh, you were the eldest son of a man who was one of the co-founders of Hamas. And indeed, for your early formative years, you worked alongside your, your father. So you got a great insight into Hamas. Tell me this from the start. What were the intended plans for Hamas when it was founded, when it started, when it developed? What was the plan? You know, since its establishment, uh, Hamas uh, uh, has one goal in mind which is annihilating the state of Israel. Like the best, let's say, compromise that they could do is having a truce for 15 years, a ceasefire for 15 years as maximum, you know, but with no guarantee how they will act after. It's absurd. I think it's worthwhile to stop him for just a second to say this, because I want you to emphasize it and take it in in your mind. He says that it's all about the destruction of Israel. Pay attention to that. It's a very satanic purpose. We've talked about this a lot, but he's already confirming the things that we've talked about. It's very important that you guys see this. It's important that you listen to what he's saying. It's important. And, and I will probably stop him a few times. I know there have been a few people that haven't been happy about me doing it, but um, I, it's critical that we talk about this a little bit. Now, Pierce is going to ask him an interesting question. He's going to ask him basically why he left Hamas. And uh, it, it's sort of a longer portion of the video, but I'm going to cut that out. He, this is him responding to that question. Very interesting stuff. 
You know, I, I have I have m many reasons. Since I was a child, I asked my father many questions about Hamas delusions, about their brutality, about their abuse of power. And always he justified, you know, their uh, position. Then I was imprisoned with Hamas. I spent about 27 months in Israeli prisons where Hamas was torturing their own members, our own people within Israeli prisons. They killed actually and tortured hundreds of prisoners. Catch that. He's in custody, Israeli custody for illegal actions by Hamas. And while he's in custody, he's watching his own people destroy one another's lives. Let that sink in for a second. These are not the Israelis that are doing this. This is his people. Uh, and this is when I start asking myself the question, what if Hamas become the ruler at some point? What will they do to our people? And uh, many years later, Hamas became the ruler of Gaza. And uh, I wasn't surprised. Is it, so he goes on to ask him this question. Uh, and he basically asks what he thinks about what happened on October 7th. Like, what do you think? And so this is his response here. As I told you, I'm not surprised by Hamas brutality, but I was surprised by the scale of their attack. You know, not to this degree, wiping out entire communities, you know, messing with a nuclear power, the most powerful country in the region, a country with a, a trauma, a great trauma from the past with a, a memory of a Holocaust and uh, all the Nazis did in the past century, you, they opened uh, the gates of hell on the Palestinian people. This is how irresponsible this group people are, you know, that they are willing to actually sacrifice many Palestinian children, the entire Palestinian people, and use them as a fuel to just achieve their ideological uh, agendas, their religious agendas. They are careless. They don't care for the human life. We have to separate between what so-called Palestinian cause and Hamas cause. Hamas cause is a sick one. It's coming from the pit of hell, you know, and they need to be removed uh, from power. It's coming from the pit of hell, coming from a man who says he's not a Christian. I, I'm just imagine how if a man who doesn't even know the Lord with his background committed to the truth, the things that he's saying here, uh, the fact that he says that they're messing with Israel, knowing how powerful Israel is and that they're bringing this upon themselves. Let all of that sink in for just a little bit. Okay. Let all of that sink in. This is important stuff. This is my message as an ex Hamas member, as a son of one of Hamas founders, that enough of this. If we don't stop them now, the next war is going to be deadlier. And only God knows what will happen next if Hamas is not finished as soon as possible. And listen to the question that Pierce is going to ask him now. It's a very poignant question and pay close attention to the answer that's being given. Mossab, how many regular Palestinians, particularly in Gaza, do you think sympathize with Hamas or indeed fully support them? You know, once Hamas is removed from power, we're going to witness people celebrating in Gaza. I guarantee you that. Mm. The people of Gaza are oppressed for so long and they had to endure siege. They had to endure violence, many wars uh, uh, for the sake of Hamas uh, uh, lust for power and for Hamas political ambition. When this comes to an end, I promise you that the Palestinian people, first of all, will thank Israel for what they did. Second, the uh, idea of annihilating the Jews and the state of Israel will be dropped forever. You know, because Hamas is the, you can say the last experiment uh, of uh, adapting violence, trying to annihilate and destroy the state of Israel. This didn't work for Yasser Arafat. It took him 40 years to realize this. Mm -hmm. And Hamas has been trying for 35 years to destroy Israel. Finally, I hope that they will come to this understanding that Israel is going nowhere. If they insist on annihilating Israel, and of course, if Iran keeps on insisting uh, on this goal, 
This means the destruction of the entire region. This is the only uncertain outcome of this because Israel is going nowhere. And by the way, he's very right about saying that. There is one thing I would disagree with him on. He thinks that if Hamas is eliminated, then nobody's going to try to kill uh, Israel. No one's going to try to continue to destroy Israel. I strongly disagree with that. I think that this is a satanically inspired thing. And as long as Satan is inspiring people, that's going to be the case. But he is right when he talks about the idea of Iran continuing to do it and many of these other nations. And he says if they continue to do it, they're all going to get obliterated. And he's right. Matter of fact, he doesn't realize how prophetic he actually is because Ezekiel 38 actually tells us that there will be a conglomerate of nations that will attack Israel, many of them Muslim. And what's unique about this is nobody will defend Israel. Israel won't be able to defend Israel. The Bible tells us, chapter 39 of Ezekiel, that God himself will defend Israel and those nations will be obliterated by God. So he's right. It'll destroy the region. And he's not wrong about that. And then Pierce asks this very interesting question. He says, how do we get to peace from here? Like, how do we find peace? I mean, you want to talk, that's the question of the century. Let me say this before he says anything. The only way we get to peace in the region is through the, the Prince of Peace, okay? Uh, let me just make myself clear. But with that said, listen to his answer. This stuff is very insightful. It's eye-opening, folks. It's very eye-opening. Take a listen. How do we get to peace from here? You know, this time, I'm afraid that war is the only way to peace. Uh, because if Hamas is not removed from power, uh, then they will uh, build more military, they will build uh, longer uh, range missiles, and the next attack, the next war is going to be deadlier. The use of force is the last resort. You can find this in every culture. And unfortunately, now Hamas left Israel and the free world as well with no choice uh, but to fight them and put an end for their violence. Uh, many civilians are dying. I understand this. Their blood is on the hands of Hamas and Hamas only. You see, it's interesting you say that because a lot of pro-Palestinians who I've had on the show in the last two weeks don't accept that argument. They say the blood of the civilians in Gaza is exclusively on the hands of Israel. And that Israel has waged uh, a repressive occupation for many decades. Um, there's been a prison camp for Gazans for a long, long time. And that that has created the environment through which a terror group like Hamas can thrive and indeed win an election, as they did in 2005. Do you buy into any of that? I mean, do you think that Israel has overreacted already to what happened to them? Their argument is... What is proportion when you have a terror attack like that on your people? By the way, when he answers this question, pay very good very good attention to it. What Pierce, the question that Pierce gives is very true. If you've been watching any of the interviews that he's been doing prior to this interview, he brings in a lot of these um, pro-Palestinian people who are making all kinds of assertions about you know, you know, imperialism and apartheid and all the other crazy words that they throw around concerning Israel, none of which are true. Listen to what this guy says when he's asked about whether or not he believes in any of that rhetoric. Listen to what he says. This is a guy that's at the core of it, okay? This is the son of the founder of Hamas, okay? Doesn't get any better than this. Take a listen. Do you buy into any of that? I mean, do you think that Israel has overreacted already? To what happened to them? Their argument is, what is proportion when you have a terror attack like that on your people? Look, since my childhood, uh, and I am hearing the stories from pro-Palestine and from those who are using what's so-called the Palestinian cause, they care the least for the Palestinian children and their future. You know, I, I am the legit, uh, legitimate representative of the Palestinian children. The child within me speaks. I don't want somebody coming from London or somebody coming from the other side of the world to tell me what is the struggle of the Palestinian children. The Palestinian children, the Palestinian society has been hijacked by these criminals and anybody who takes side, their side is participating in their crime. This is my answer to those people. And for the civilian casualties, etc., you know, first of all, Hamas is using, and it's very clearly, it's a fact that Hamas used civilians as human sheets. It's a fact. 
then it's a fact that Israel call and warn civilians to evacuate buildings before they strike them. But in the meantime, Hamas put roadblocks to stop civilians from evacuating to safe zones. Hamas single misfire killed hundreds of refugees taking shelter at a hospital, and they blamed Israel. What are we talking about here? Israel is a democracy. Israel is accountable. Israel is not thirsty for the Palestinian blood. In the meantime, Israel is capable of wiping out Arab capitals in seconds. Why Israel does not attempt to abuse its power? But why, when the Arabs have just a little bit of power, a couple of missiles, they misuse power by launching them at civilians and kill them in their living rooms? We have a fundamental problem, and we need to stop blaming Israel. We invited this upon our heads, and the rest of the world, if they don't know the reality on the ground, it's better than they shut up. <laughs> ah, it's better that they shut up. Oh, my goodness. He's right. He's right. It's better that they do that. It's like the Black Lives Matter movement. They don't care about black people. They'll just run their mouth and use this so-called group of, you know, this this cause that they have to accomplish their idealistic uh, purposes. Look at this, guys. Like, I'm going to show this to you again, okay, just so that you can see it. I, I have to prove the point. Look at this picture. Look at the picture. This is current up until the 21st of October of the almost... 5,800 rockets that were fired, okay? 550 of them came back into Gaza, misfired and damaged people into Gaza. The dark dots that you see are the location of the rocket launchers and the light dots are the areas where all of the rockets came back and destroyed people within the border of Gaza. And I also want you to notice something because this is very important. Notice how they have all these rockets that are lined up. This is like very important. They've got all these rockets that are lined up on the southern section of the Gaza Strip. You know why they have those rocket launchers set there? They have them set there because that is the southern border of Gaza, right along the Egyptian border. Why? Because when Israel goes to fire to destroy those rocket launchers, they're hoping that some of Israel's munitions will hit Egypt, thus bringing Egypt into some kind of incursion. We need to wake up. This is the game that they played. And he said it very, very clearly here. It's a very powerful statement. And then Pierce does this. He, he says, look, you seem to be very angry by this. And he's not like uh, putting him down or anything. He says, you know, this is a, you obviously are very impassioned by this. And after he makes that comment about his impassion and the anger that he has, he asks him this question. He says, do you still have any contact with your family? Meaning the Hamas terrorists. Do you have any contact with your family? Look at what he says. He, he gets very, very like, um, he has a very intense response. It's a, it's a heavy response. Listen to what he says. This is irrelevant right now. I don't have any contact with my family and I don't care anymore. You know, enough bloodshed and enough involvement from people who don't care. They're just uh, warriors on keyboard. You know, and they're just the storming uh, world capitals saying free Palestine, free Palestine. They don't know what the hell Palestine is. I am Palestine. And I say it's enough of Hamas. It's enough of the corrupt leaderships that they are killing our people. Misleading them to hell is enough of that. We don't want Palestinian state. I don't want Palestinian state. Palestinian children need education, they need security, they need life. This is what they need. They don't need another corrupt Arab regime. Now, listen to the question that Pierce asks him. It's a very important question, actually. I think it's vital because there's a lot of people that say, well, what Israel is doing, they shouldn't be doing because they're going to make it way worse in the region. So Pierce asks a very poignant question and listen to the response that's being given here uh, right after Pierce asks the question. It's a very, very uh, poignant question with a pretty good answer. Is it possible to get rid of Hamas in the way that Israel is currently trying to do through uh, airstrike bombardments and, and it is planned now an imminent ground invasion. Is that the best way to do it? Or is there a danger of radicalizing a lot more young 
Palestinians to the Hamas cause in the process. Listen to this. We are going to remove Hamas from power. Remember my words, okay? And Hamas did not only bring the wrath of Israel over Gaza. Hamas brought the wrath of God. We are going to remove them from power and we are going to persecute their leaders and we are going to bring them, bring them to justice and the world will witness their punishment. And everyone who, who take their side today in this state of confusion, thinking that this is a joke, I tell those people that you are going to regret taking the side of Hamas. You are going to, take the, uh, to regret taking the side of those criminals who are uh, killing uh, the Palestinian people. By the way, uh, after the, I think it's a great response. And then immediately after the response, he asks him the very last question. And he says, um, you were born in Ramallah. He says, don't you ever dream of going back to your home? Don't you want to go back to your home? Listen to what his response is here. It's, it's amazing when you think about the, the psyche behind it. We'll talk about it in a minute. Mossab, you were born in Ramallah. That's your home. Do you dream of going home one day? Is that something you still aspire to do? I prefer not to ask to answer this question. So he says, I prefer not to answer this question, as you just heard. Now, I think the reason why he's saying that is because he's very deeply affected by it. He knows that there's no way he can go back to Ramallah. He knows that if that's the case, his, his, his life is in danger, and probably more so the life of people that are close to him that aren't, may not be necessarily connected to all of this. Um, it's tragic. It's tragic. And I also think that he probably in his heart maybe doesn't want to go back because why would he want to go back to a terrible way of life? My point behind all of this is I hope that you guys will get a glimpse of the way the devil likes to lie. And then I want to take it a step further because there are people that are in places of prominence that are actually supporting all of this evil and all of this wickedness. We are, uh, we've are we got a headline in the news, in the New York Post, and I'm going to play another video for you that's going to open your eyes to this to see how seriously ugly all of this is. But there's uh, an article that just came out in the New York Post regarding George Soros, and it said that groups behind Israel bashing protests backing Hamas attacks got $15 million plus from Soros. And basically what this is saying is since 2016, George Soros has funneled well over $15 million into groups behind uh, this month's pro-Palestinian protests. I'm reading this directly. Where demonstrators openly cheered Hamas militants craven terrorist attacks on Israel. A post-examination of Open Society Foundation's records shows Soros' grant-making network gave $13.7 million of the money through uh, Tide Center, a deeply pocketed lefty advocacy group that sponsors several nonprofits who've justified Hamas's bloody attacks while claiming Palestinians obsessed with the eradication of the Jewish state are the real victims. Tide's beneficiaries include Illinois-based uh, Adlah Justice Project, which on the day of October 7th massacre posted a photo on Instagram of a bulldozer tearing apart Israel's border fence down and a caption, Israeli colonizers believe they could indefinitely trap 2 million people in an open air prison. No cage goes unchallenged. Can you imagine that nonsense? These are the people that Soros is funding. By the way, speaking of globalist funding or globalist funded type of mindsets. How about you listen to Antonio Guterres, who, by the way, is the UN Secretary General. He is an evil and dark man. Listen to him speak about what's going on over there, his perspective on what happened on October the 7th. And basically, when you listen to the first two minutes of what he says, he is, in essence, going to be justifying the terrorist actions of Hamas. Listen to what he says here. This is uh, pretty striking. It's astounding. Uh, let's take a listen. Here it is. Excellencies, the situation in the Middle East is growing more dire by the hour. The war in Gaza is raging and risks spiraling throughout the region. Divisions are splintering societies. Tensions threaten to boil over. Divisions are splintering societies. He's generalizing. 
the attack that happened so that he can make it look like something that was not unilateral. He's making it look like something that was actually provoked. And if you think I'm lying, listen to what he says as he finishes on. I won't disturb him until we cut off the end of what he says. Take a listen. At a crucial moment like this, it is vital to be clear on principles, starting with the fundamental principle of respecting and protecting civilians. I have condemned unequivocally the horrifying and unprecedented 7 October acts of terror by Hamas in Israel. Nothing can justify the deliberate killing, injuring, and kidnapping of civilians or the launching of rockets against civilian targets. All hostages must be treated humanely and released immediately and without conditions. And I respectfully note the presence among us of members of their families. Excellencies, it is important to also recognize the attacks by Hamas did not happen in a vacuum. The Palestinian people have been subjected to 56 years of suffocating occupation. <laughs> it didn't happen in a vacuum. 56 years of suffocating occupation. Hmm. 2005, Israel left Gaza completely. The open air prison argument we just heard about. Guys, look, let me just finish up by simply saying this. The devil is a liar. Let me say that again. The devil is a liar. I'm going to have my editor rewind this and play you the verse that I just read. You are of your father, the devil, and the lusts of your father you will do. He was a murderer from the beginning. Right? We just talked about this. And abode not in the truth, because there is no truth in him. When he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own, for he is a liar and the father of it. So there it is, folks. The devil is good at what he does. He's a liar. And he is trying to steal, kill, and destroy and as Christians, we have the message of hope. We've got the light. We've got the gospel. But you know what a big part of the gospel is? It is the propagation of truth because of the fact that we've been transformed by the blood of Jesus, and we need to continue to tell the truth. The devil is very good at what he does, and this grand conspiracy truly is a grand conspiracy. The devil is working over time. It's time for us to wake up, guys. We are in the last days. Christ could come at any moment. Let's get on it. Let's get to it. Let's get to work. God bless you guys.